Welcome back for chapter five, everyone. I'm glad that you're here. We're going to have a good talk today. Um, but before we go forward, there was something in chapter four that I thought about after I posted the video yesterday that I think is important. We see Ezekiel go through what seems like um, torture, really. <laughs> he had to lay on his side for days upon end and then eat bread that was cooked over human and cow manure. And it causes us to think, well, why? Why is God doing that? Well, if we look closer at the chapter, if you go back and reread it, it says that he was to bear the iniquity of Israel. So part of the judgment was temporarily cast upon him, although, you know, God was more uh, sparing and tolerant with him than he was with the people of Jerusalem. So something to think about, you know, is really kind of a foreshadowing of Christ when you think about it. Um, but I think it's important to point that out. All right, let's get into it. Verse 1, as for you, son of man, take a sharp sword, take and use it as a barber's razor on your head and beard. Then take scales for weighing and divide the hair. One third you shall burn in the fire at the center of the city when the days of the siege are completed. Then you shall take one third and strike it with the sword all around the city. And one third you shall scatter to the wind and I will unsheath a sword behind them. Take also a few in number from them and bind them in the edges of your robes. Take again some of them and throw them into the fire and burn them in the fire. From it, a fire will spread to all the house of Israel. Pause. The sword is symbolic here because it's not the proper tool used to cut hair. It clearly held significance to the coming judgment. Yet the cutting of the hair did occur to display mourning and humiliation. The dividing of his hair into thirds was to show some would die by the sword, others by plague and famine, and others punished by fire. Thus says the Lord God, this is Jerusalem. I have set her at the center of the nations with lands around her. But she has rebelled against my ordinances more wickedly than the nations and against my statutes more than the lands which surround her. For they have rejected my ordinances and have not walked in my statutes. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have more turmoil than the nations which surround you and have not walked in my statutes, nor observed my ordinances, nor observe the ordinances of the nations which surround you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I, even I, am against you, and I will execute judgments among you in the sight of the nations. And because of all your abominations, I will do among you what I have not done, and the like of which I will never do again. Therefore, fathers will eat their sons among you, and sons will eat their fathers. For I will execute judgments on you and scatter all your remnant to every wind. So as I live, declares the Lord God, surely, because you have defiled my sanctuary with all your detestable idols and with all your abominations, therefore I will also withdraw, and my eye will have no pity and I will not spare. One third of you will die by a plague or be consumed by famine among you. One third will fall by the sword around you, and one third I will scatter to every wind." and I will unsheath a sword behind them. All right, let's talk about this. In verse 11, it says that God will withdraw, which includes his spirit, which maintains peace, balance, and order amongst the world. God is the only thing in this universe that can restrain evil. Yet, the spirit of lawlessness is actively prevalent in our societies. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 7 says, uh, For the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds it back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. This implies that during the tribulation period, when the Antichrist is given permission to wreak havoc on the earth, the Holy Spirit will step aside and allow it, though his presence will not fully abandon mankind. I believe it's a similar situation going on here with Jerusalem. Thus my anger will be spent, and I will satisfy my wrath on them, and I will be appeased. Then they will know that I, the Lord, have spoken in my zeal when I have spent my wrath upon them. Moreover, I will make you a desolation and a reproach among the nations which surround you in the sight of all who pass by. So it will be a reproach, a reviling, a warning, and an object of horror to the nations who surround you when I execute judgments against you in anger, wrath, and raging rebukes. I, the Lord, have spoken." Okay, so it's super important that we remember that in the days of the Old Covenant, God would pour his anger and wrath out upon his people. We clearly see that. 
However, in the new covenant, once Christ came, all that anger and wrath was poured upon Christ once for all, as we discussed in the book of Hebrews. So we need to separate the two. All right, here we go. Verse 16. When I send against them the deadly arrows of famine, which were for the destruction of those whom I will send to destroy you, then I will also intensify the famine upon you and break the staff of bread. Moreover, I will send on you famine and wild beasts, and they will bereave you of children. Plague and bloodshed also will pass through you, and I will bring the sword on you. I, the Lord, have spoken. All right, well, instead of a snippet today, I've had some thoughts stirring on my heart and mind that I wanted to write down and share with you guys. In my opinion, what we're reading about all throughout the Old Testament about Israel's sin, stubbornness, wicked acts, followed by a prophet giving them a warning and then receiving God's judgment, really ties into what we're all living through in our present day. Now, this judgment is for unbelievers, but believers are caught in the middle, and it's for a reason. It really is the same pattern of Old Testament judgment, if you think about it. How far from God has our world strayed in these days of technological advancements? 2 Timothy chapter 3 discusses how the love of God and the love of others will grow worse as we approach the last days. Personally, I can see this from grade school kids all the way up to the world elites and everyone in between. So at this time, I truly believe we've had our warnings through scripture and the church for decades. And now we're in the judgment. Think about it. We have leaders worldwide ignoring the cries of the people and enforcing ungodly and unlawful policies by force, restricting law, allowing crimes to go unpunished, ignoring scientific facts for the sake of profit, protecting the vile while attacking those proclaiming righteousness, right is wrong and wrong is right. This is biblical prophecy unfolding before our eyes, and God is completely in control and has no problem allowing it to happen. And I'm not sharing any of this with any motive to promote fear. That would be sinful. I say this because I want us to be paying attention and to be ready and alert. Honestly, God could call us home at any moment. We need to be sober and be on the ready. My point to this rant is to think about all these lessons that we've learned from Moses, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and now Ezekiel. What was the point of God's judgment? To get people to turn their eyes to the Lord and cry out in repentance. We also see that those who were God-honoring often received God's supernatural protection in the midst of his judgments. Our mission is clear. Possess regenerate hearts through faith in Christ that leads to repentance. Do not live in fear. Lay all of our petitions and requests before the Lord. And go out into the world proclaiming the good news and making disciples. That is it, you guys. That should be the sole meaning and purpose on our minds when we wake up every morning. All right, I'm going to climb down from the soapbox now, but that was pressing on my heart. And in light of our study these last few years, I just, I felt it was important. And thank you for listening. Let's pray. Dear Lord, as always, we're grateful that you've given us another day and for all the blessings you've bestowed upon us. We thank you for our salvation, our relationship with you, our relationships with the ones we love, our health, jobs, shelter, running water, food on our plates, and of course, your amazing word. We'd like to continue asking you to cast your gaze upon those that we know and love who have not yet surrendered to you. In fact, I'm going to give us some time together collectively right now to name any family members, friends, co-workers, or other acquaintances that come to mind who we don't believe have placed their faith in the Lord. I ask that we each use this time to name them before you and that we collectively pray that you would please extend grace to them for their stubbornness and ignorance, and that you would put them in your book of life and work out a plan for the rest of their days to restore them. All right, let's take a few moments.
Lord, we greatly appreciate you hearing these pleas to you. And you know how sensitive a matter this is to us and how much concern that we have for each of these individuals. Please hear these heartfelt cries to you and continue doing your glorious work of salvation. In Jesus' name, what do we say? <laughs> All right, you guys, God bless you. Have a wonderful day. Thank you for being here. Take care.